My name is Dave Truss, and this is Shifting Learning. What did you learn in school today? And if, if we look at this question, I think that uh, just about everybody, especially if you're a parent, but just about everybody, including teachers, uh, have had the experience of hearing this question and then a response that they actually didn't like. And um, I know for me, um, what I wonder about is how do you want students to respond to that question? I think we're all very good at saying what we don't want to hear, but I'm not sure we often think about what we really would want to hear when people ask that, when students respond to how, what did you learn at school today? I know for myself, as a parent, I would be a little disappointed if uh, the answers to, the, to that question always came from Google, it was always easily searchable and something that my children could have found out um, by means other than having an experience of a, a school day with a, a dynamic teacher in front of them. And so uh, what do you want your students to say is a question that I have um, and I wonder about. So what I'd really like to do is to have you share your thoughts. And please share some ideas of what, what you want your students to say to a response, what did you learn at school today? Well, thank you for your contributions. And so here's another question for you to think about, and that is where would you want your students to be in this diagram? And this is sort of a... Um, just a question to think about, uh, but I think that we live in an incredibly uh, amazing time, but it's a time when things are changing very, very quickly. And it's one of those things where uh, I think that when you, when you see a lot of videos and they talk about how the top jobs today weren't even conceived of five years ago, uh, we, we, want, we want a place where students are dynamic and they're constantly learning and they're thinking about how to do things differently. And we want that sort of uh, person who's going to make a difference. And so I'm going to ask a few questions here. One of the things that I, I wonder about are what questions can we ask besides what did you learn at school today? Uh, what is it that we value in those answers? And what do you really want students to share? And I'm leaving those questions out there and I'm starting the presentation with them, but we're actually going to get back to these questions a little later. So a little bit about me. Uh, I actually took off uh, to China in a, a few years ago and stayed there for two years. Uh, before that, I was an employee of the school, school district 43 Coquitlam in British Columbia, the suburbs of Vancouver. And when I came back in 2000, summer of 2011, I became the vice principal of Coquitlam Open Learning. Coquitlam Open Learning uh, is the main school and a big part of my job. Last year, what happened is the principal at the time, Stephen Whiffen, started another little school uh, within Coquitlam Open Learning. And it was uh, something that he pitched to our superintendent, Tom Grant. And basically, he pitched this idea. And it just fit perfectly with the sort of school, the school district vision of learning without boundaries. And here in BC, there's a BC education plan. And it sort of coincided with the BC education plan in the idea of uh, focus on personalized learning. It is a blended instruction school. And what that means is there's uh, an online component and an important face-to-face -face component. And I'll tell you a little bit about what things look like at the Inquiry Hub. Students start their day with topical workshops. And a topical workshop is an opportunity for our teachers to take pieces of the, the required courses that they're learning and making sure that they're doing something engaging, interesting, and uh, dynamic with them, uh, with the students, that allows them to get more than what a, a typical online uh, t student would get. So a great example of that is uh, Mr. Soyseth, the teacher here. He actually last year ran, did for all grades, grades 9 through, through 11. We didn't have any grade 12s last year, but nine, grades 9, 10, 11. He ran um, a, a Shakespeare play 
where the students took on the persona of characters and wrote blog posts to each other. Uh, that's the kind of thing where the, the discussions that he did and the interactions and the talking about the textbook uh, just gave it a much more a richer experience than just strictly an on online experience for, for these students. One of the things that they want to do as well is they want to try and take out pieces of the curriculum so that there's not as much to do online um, for these students. That said, we do have extensive online resources and um, one of the benefits of being a, a small school within Coquitlam Open Learning is we have a vast number of courses that students can take above and beyond what our our face-to-face -face teachers uh, can do. A big piece of what the Inquiry Hub looks like is about flexible uh, assessment and allowing students to demonstrate their learning in a multitude of ways. They can share their learning through videos. Uh, the left-hand side here is part of a blog post for, that students did. Um, they do a lot of presentations. We do a lot of assessment through rubrics. And we still have some traditional tests and so on, but there's a lot of autonomy by students to be able to share, um, share their learning and be assessed in different ways. And we're a small school that has a learning commons environment. And so even though we have a class, a couple classrooms, the classrooms all have tables that are on wheels. Um, and we can adjust the, the shape of the, the room to look different. We have a computer lab that we tend to have as the more quiet space. Uh, it, it is bring your own laptop, but the students can plug into the computer lab. Uh, we have a, a, a bigger learning commons, which used to be a library. We also have a couple other interesting spaces. One is a garden that was started by the students that I'll tell you about a little bit more about. And then also uh, a, a room that was used as a lab that we're actually designing into a maker space this year. And one of the most important things about the uh, Inquiry Hub is that we have dedicated inquiry time. And so we have time scheduled every afternoon where students are um, giving that time to inquiry questions that they have designed themselves. And we figure out ways to give them credit for that. Uh, three examples very quickly. Uh, Jay at the top left, um, he, um, because he wanted to, has taken some um, measurements of our school and he has built a scale model of the school in Google uh, SketchUp. The three girls that started the garden are working on a greenhouse, an indoor greenhouse, where they started growing things before the growing season started here. And from this year, uh, Chloe and Joey, uh, you can see that uh, Chloe's holding a lawnmower engine. That lawnmower engine is now in, in pieces. Uh, they've taken it apart, and they hope to put it back together and make the engine a little more efficient. And so that's a little bit about the kinds of things that we're doing at our school. Uh, and it's a very different look. And I recognize for people that perhaps you think, well, my school may not look like that. And so what can you do in your classroom uh, since you don't, may not have the structures that we have? And so I did a presentation a while back called Seven Ways to Transform Your Classroom. And these are aspects that we are working on at the Inquiry Hub. I wouldn't say we're doing them perfectly. I think we have a long way to go. Uh, and yet, I think that these are things that are important to us and we're working towards. And I think there are also things that any educator can kind of focus on one aspect and start to bring a little bit more of that into your classroom. And when I say a little bit more, I think these are things most teachers already think about and do. It's just a matter of adding and, and going a little deeper. So. The first one is just um, empowering students to really be uh, follow their interests and to inquire about things that they want to learn. And um, I provided a link here to resources that I got from a conference. And I would challenge you now to um, check out that link and to uh, make sure that uh, you just pick one thing that that you can say, all right, Here's a resource that I could use to help focus uh, you know, my students with inquiry learning. I think student voice is really important. And one way that we try to do that is by giving them uh, students some, uh, some choice. 
uh, letting them decide when they want to work on, on their, their different courses, uh, what they want to work on, what questions they want to ask, and how they might be assessed for that. And so uh, one of the challenges that I've asked, and I, I have a uh, open educator manifesto is the link here, um, but you know, do you allow students to own their own learning? Because who's, who, is, who is learning in the school and, uh, and in your classroom? And if it's the students that are learning, shouldn't they own that as opposed to the teacher? Uh, audience is important, and it's interesting. Uh, I was a teacher for years, and I would always tell students, audience matters. It's important that you have an audience. I didn't truly get it until I started to blog, and when I started to blog, I had a legitimate audience, and that's when I recognized the true value. And I think that it's important that we need to think about, are we providing our students with a legitimate audience for the work that they do? Or are they just doing work for the teacher? And if you're doing work for the teacher, it kind of goes back to the idea of voice and um, making sure that uh, they have, you know, that they're owning the learning as well. Community is important, and I think that's one that every teacher works on. And so for, for this topic, I actually talked a little, uh, shared a link more about the idea of collaboration and how important that is. We live in a world where more, more and more we're having to work with people across different uh, disciplines and in different situations. And collaboration is a learned skill. It's not something that people just do innately, and it takes practice. Uh, and with that, uh, I think an, a great opportunity that we have is to extend our, our school into the community and make things outside of the classroom matter to, to students. Leadership is also really important, uh, and I think that authentic leadership, where students are given that chance to actually make decisions about what they do in the school and, and what happens at the school is really important. I wrote my master's paper on building a leadership program in a middle school, and it's an idea that's really dear to me. And if, if people are interested, they can ask me during the discussion about one of the ways that uh, students are showing their leadership in our uh, program. Uh, another aspect is the idea of play. And sometimes I think, uh, uh, not in all situations, but sometimes I think even in my, in myself, there are times when I've taken the fun out of learning. And it's not intentional, but I think that it's something that we do need to, to think about and really realize that when you, if you empower students to really engage in, in areas of their own interest, then learning actually becomes much more fun. I've shared a link here to a, a TED talk about game design. Uh, it's kind of interesting because this is something that was sort of a failure for us last year when uh, I, t I taught the digital literacy course to students, and I had a student who worked with me, and we were trying to design a um, a badge system for our our digital literacy course. And my student, he ended up with an A in the course. He wrote thousands of lines of code and probably uh, spent about 150 hours uh, doing this for what's called an IDS, an independent directed study that we designed for him. And uh, he had it running for a little while, but we never really got it set up. So in a way, it was a failure, but it was also for him a, a profound learning experience where he got to pursue and really push uh, and challenge himself, especially around the areas of, of design, uh, which, which he found to be the, the hardest part. Um, and I think that uh, the idea of uh, networks is something that uh, is just amazing. Uh, I look at my experience as an educator and how I've grown because of my network of people that I'm connected to. And you know, Lisa Durf, who's the moderator here, I've, I've known her for seven years. I still have never seen a picture of her, but I know about her and I learn from her. And there's so many people that I've been able to network with and, and learn from. And I think that sometimes we forget that, that students have the potential to do that as well. And uh, one of the things that, that I'm fascinated about is the idea that we used to focus a lot on the idea of groups and how important groups are. But networks are profoundly 
uh, more valuable. And, uh, you know, our, the simple metaphor for me is our brain is a network and truly understands how networks work. And so we need to, t to sort of harness that and help people understand how they can harness the networks around them. And so for inquiry learning is about active learning. And it's really powerful when it's student driven. It's really important that we uh, facilitate that and we don't expect that students can just have an idea and pursue it on their own and that we as teachers are facilitating and supporting uh, the learning that's going on. And it's also about asking really good questions because if, if we can get students to have uh, really thoughtful questions, then we can get rich and compelling answers uh, for those questions and that gets really interesting. That said, um, uh, Judy Halbert and Linda Ka Kayser, um talk about the idea that it's not just about the pursuit of a perfect question and I really like that point. Uh, we want students developing those really important questions, but it's actually about the process. It's that, that process of, of, of new learning and taking action uh, that's really important. Not just the question itself, but the process that students go through in developing it and then following through. And so here's a few examples from our program that, that I'd like to share. The first one is our Green Inquiry Project. And the uh, student in the center of the photo of the Tri-City newspaper, her name is Shauna, and right at, at, I think early October last year, just at the start of the year, she wrote a grant for $5,000 from the World Wildlife Fund to build an urban garden, and she actually, uh, she got the grant. And so they, ha they had $5,000 to decide what they were going to do with it. And so they took a old um, courtyard of ours that had, if you look on the bottom picture on the, on the right-hand side, two really old boxes, uh, garden boxes, and they decided that they were going to add more and redesign the garden. They did everything involved in figuring out this garden. They, um, they wanted to, the community involved and they did all the planning, all the deciding what to purchase. Where we helped, uh, when, we, when they had the, the, the garden build day, literally the only responsibility I had was I took care of the barbecue. Everything else was taken care of by them. Deciding how much wood to buy, how much soil uh, to purchase, what plants and what they would be planting, uh, how they were going to collect tools from uh, uh, people. They wanted it to run from 11 uh, a.m. till 7 p.m. because they wanted uh, parents who had to work to have an opportunity to come and participate and be involved. During that entire process of them organizing it, one of the few things I did was uh, they wanted the um, garden to extend onto the gravel, as you can see here. And uh, when they asked the district, because I set up a meeting for them to ask the district, and I wasn't even in that meeting, uh, I just set it up, but uh, they were told no, uh, that they couldn't ac extend it onto the concrete. And so where I was involved was I asked them, well, what was their reason for no? And it seemed that they just wanted to extend it too far and they wanted access around the building. So I had them go back with a proposal. And as you can see, they went back and they were able to convince them that they could have the garden uh, extend as, as, as a metaphor for an urban garden going uh, up, up beyond the green spaces. And so that was a, a real successful day with uh, our entire community involved and completely organized by students. Some of the other things that are currently happening this year, I mentioned already that Jay was working on designing 3D models to scale using uh, Google SketchUp. We have a student here whose dad is in commercial glass, and commercial glass, uh, when it's damaged and broken, gets thrown in the dump. There is no process for recycling it. And so we have a student, and what she wants to do is she wants to research possible ways that the glass that's been broken can be reused. Uh, either for decorative or other purposes. And she actually wants to develop a, a program where uh, um, commercial glass companies have a means to recycle rather than throw away their broken glass. Uh, the students working on the garden are now constructing uh, 
both an aquaponic and hydroponic uh, gardens, and that's the, how they're extending things this year. Later in the year, they want to actually teach um, some young grade ones and twos um, how to uh, garden and the importance of, of gardening, and they want to create a curriculum for them and ha give them one of the flower beds to work with. So these are some of the neat things that are happening, and I know what some of you are thinking who are uh, uh, doing presentations, and yes, I broke rules and I put way too many uh, words on this slide. So what I want to do now is I want to narrow it down. When you say what are students doing, here's the essence of what they're doing. And so this is the part that I think is important. We're no longer looking at just the content, but we're actually looking at what students are doing and the actions that they're taking uh, as part of their learning. And the reality is some of them will fail. And I want that to happen. And the reason I want that to happen is because I think that too often we don't raise the bar high enough in education. We don't push students to the maximum potential that they can have. And I believe that if every kid were successful in every one of the projects that I just mentioned, then really what we did was we didn't push them hard enough. And I have a little acronym that I like to use, and that is failure always invites learning. With every failure, there's the potential for learning. And that's something that we need to really instill in students. And so looking uh, at this chart, you know, first off, we need students to, to be engaged, and giving them topics is important. A lack of effort just hurts everybody. And when we can um, support students to make sure that they are truly trying their best, then I think we, we can really move mountains. Uh, as far as resources and support, those are, those are aspects that are really important. They're the parts that make teachers important today, even with uh, the ability for um, marks, uh, you know, things to be self-graded online and uh, to be able to deliver things through video and all kinds of uh, ways that people think that are going to you know, transform education. I think what's really going to transform education is our teachers' skills in being able to see the resources and the support that's needed for students to make sure that students are constantly reflecting on what they're doing and then working on their lack of knowledge. And the lack of knowledge is really interesting because the lack of knowledge that I'm talking about isn't just about feeding students information, but it's actually making sure that they're supported enough that they can seek that knowledge that they need. And so when we get rid of the unproductive kind of failure, when we're offering all the support, well then we, we're creating better opportunities for people to be successful. But when we're trying to do something truly audacious, when we're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, like a student who is sitting here saying, you know, commercial glass is being thrown in our, um, uh, is being thrown away as waste, and I think that there's a way that we can change that. Well, her project has a high potential for failure. That doesn't mean she's going to fail. We're going to do everything in our power to make sure that she's successful and maybe she changes an entire industry. But there's high potential for learning no matter what she does when she's trying to do something this big. The, uh, the original principal, uh, Stephen Whiffen, he used to say that when um, he believed that every student that went through our program should have as a part of their graduating portfolio my epic failure as uh, something that they had to share. And the th the, what we want to do is we want to see people trying something truly epic putting their hearts into it. And if they fail, they are going to fail um, in the process of that. They are going to try things and do things they've never done before, and they will be far more successful in that failure and in their ability to learn new things and new ideas than if we had set the bar too low and made sure that they were always able to succeed in everything we, they do. That said, it's a teacher's job to improve the success quotient. We want to make sure that they're trying things and being um, 
persevering through the, the frustrations of things not working. Uh, and I believe that when you do that, unexpected discoveries happen because you, you're, you know, luck comes to those who are prepared. Uh, and we want them collaborating and believing in themselves and having a positive attitude. And so failure always invites the learning, and it's our duty as educators to see that potential and make sure that the learning is, is found even when failure occurs. And Stephen Downs says, to teach is to model and demonstrate, to learn is to practice and reflect. And it's so important that students see that we are pushing ourselves, that we are being challenging, uh, challenging what we know and what we understand. And it's okay that we try things with our students and that we fail as well. And so I think that it's important for us to, to demonstrate and model exactly what we're tr trying to achieve with our students. And this is the model that we're using uh, by the BC Teacher Librarian Association called the Points of, of Inquiry. And so we want students to wonder about things um, and, to, and to wonder with an A as they connect to ideas outside of what, what they would normally think. We want them to investigate. We want them to dig deep. We want them to, na to know how to do research really well. And we want them to um, be uh, very rigorous and, and work hard at, at uh, um, finding out the information that they need and, and helping and support them. We want them to construct things with purpose that have meaning and to build things because uh, and design things because that's something that uh, we want to see all students do. We want them to express it and to share their ideas with not just with their community but with the entire world. And we want them constantly reflecting and thinking about how they can do things better and to think about their own learning process. And I just went through this uh, points of inquiry and inquiry in a nice cycle. But the reality is inquiry is extremely messy. And sometimes when they connect and wonder, uh, they realize that they reflect and realize that they actually want to investigate something different. And as they investigate something different and they try to construct something, they realize it's not working and they reflect. Maybe after they reflect, they go back and connect and wonder before they start to construct, at which point they may realize we don't know anything about our new approach and have to go back and investigate all the time reflecting, not just on what they're doing, but the learning process itself. And so it's a very messy thing, but the important thing is that we have students learning about learning. So we're talking to them about the points of inquiry, and we're having them dig in, in, into what this means, and coming back to it, and learning with them about how we can go through this process, this messy process, and make it something that is exciting and engaging, and building stuff with purpose and meaning. And so for a long time, what we've thought about learning is what, what is it that needs to be learned? What is it that, uh, what is the knowledge, what is the information, what is the content that is important? And we haven't really been thinking that much about uh, learning as the process and learning as what students need to do, the action. And so where that leaves me now is thinking about, well, what did you learn at school today? What is it we really want to hear students say? What is the response that we want? And so I asked you this once already to share your thoughts, and I'll ask you again. Um, I was really impressed with the responses that I saw, but there's some new people in the room now. So what is it that you want to hear when you, um, when you ask this question? Please use the, um, the text box that you see on your left, and you can um, click on it and share your ideas. Fantastic. Thank you for your contributions. And so one of my things that I wanted to do with this presentation, you can keep typing. One of the things I want to do with this presentation was I, I deliberately wanted to ask the same question twice. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to provide some context to the questions that I asked. Uh, you can see down the side here, I also um, gave some prompts from the discussion. And I think that sometimes we ask big questions, but we don't scaffold 
and provide the information to students that, uh, to help them get the answers we really want. And um, I can see that there's some uh, great responses here. So thanks to those who contributed. And so extending the learning beyond the classroom, um, I think that one of the things is as you start to do inquiry, it's important that parents understand what it is that you want and what it is that you value and so that the support can be there. And I did this presentation or actually a version of it just um, a couple nights ago with uh, Heidi Haskable who is now in the room uh, at a, a, a district PAC meeting. And uh, I, I want to share some of the things that, that I shared there. So I think that one of the things to recognize is that if a parent were to only ask these kinds of questions, what mark did you get on your test? How much homework did you have? How did your team do in today's game? Well, I think the reality is that those questions tell the student, tell their child what it is that they value. None of these questions are bad in and of themselves, but if these are the only kinds of questions that a parent is asking, or if a, a, a teacher is asking, then I think that gives a message about the values of what, what really matters. And so what, I asked this at the beginning and I said I'd come back to it. What questions can you ask? What do you value? What, what's important to you? And what do you want to, students to share? And so for me, I would challenge that it's, it's what it is is what we want students to do. What do students do at school? And so think of it. If we want students to learn how to learn, one example of a good question is, what was your biggest challenge today? If we want our students to be compassionate and caring, who did you help today? If you want students to truly enjoy learning, what was your favorite part of the day or what questions did you ask today? I think these prof are profoundly different than the questions I, I had on the previous slides. And I'll give you a personal example because uh, over five years ago, I started asking both my daughters two questions every night. Who did you help today and what was your favorite part of the day? And although it's died down with my, old, my oldest daughter, my youngest daughter who is now 11, if I don't ask her one of these questions, uh, when I'm putting her to bed, then she will ask me. And sometimes our favorite part of the day needs to be that moment because there wasn't much else for that day. And so just sharing w with her is, is the favorite part of the day. And sometimes we have to be honest and say we didn't help anyone that day. But I know for a fact that uh, more often than not, there are some really wonderful answers to these questions. I just wanted my daughter to end with a, a, a great thought of what her favorite part of the day was. But I also wanted her to know that I value that she's caring and compassionate. And I see that in her. And I know that it's innate in her and that's part of her nature. But I also know that the fact that I ask it every night tells her what I value and what's important. And I think that we as teachers need to remember that the questions we ask tell students what is important and what it is we value and what it is we want them to know and understand. And so in shifting our learning uh, to more engaging uh, inquiry-based and problem-based uh, classrooms, what kind of answers do you want to what did we learn at school today? Thank you. That's my presentation. That was fantastic. A round of virtual applause. And you, if you have a question for our esteemed guest, you can either write it into the chat box or you can come on audio. A question there in the chat from Julie. Do you see that? I see also from Peggy. OK. So Julie, what can I do? for the older students who are, who are more apathetic. I think the, for, you know, the older students are, and uh, you know, I, I had this interesting conversation with a parent of a grade 12 saying, well, you know, how, how do I get a more engaging answer to what did you learn at school today when for the last five years she's been telling me nothing? Um, and, and it's a good question. And I think that for, the, for kids who seem more apathetic, I think, uh, 
the most important thing that I believe is finding something that they are truly interested in as, as a topic. And I know that some students are, some teachers are in content areas where, you know, they're tied to a, an exam that they have to teach to. Um, but I think that there's still ways to engage students and to have them, um, uh, have them think about the content in meaningful ways. Uh, there's a fantastic Dan Meyer TED Talk. Uh, which is worth seeing, uh, where he talks about how he hooks students in. Um, but I think, f with respect to my presentation, um, I, I think allowing students to truly um, find th topics that they're interested in uh, as starting points to, to help them get engaged. And Peggy's question was, how do young kids answer the questions about what challenged them today? Um, that's a question I haven't asked my daughter in a while, but uh, sometimes it can be uh, a content as far as, uh, you know, subject matter, uh, a math problem that was really hard. But sometimes it even became things where um, something happened and I didn't know how to respond. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of interesting, and I think that um, uh, one of the things that 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 is important is as we ask these kind of questions, it's hard for for students to answer at the beginning, right? You, you know, um, I I can remember my daughter when I first asked her, you know, who did you help today? And I would get responses, well, you know, my te my teacher asked us to be quiet, so I was quiet, and so you know, basically following instructions was was helping. Um, but it, the, the, as I asked more and more, I started to get things, and you know, and then I started to get report cards where the the comment was about how helpful she is in the classroom, and so you know, it's neat to see those things kind of develop. What can you do for college students who are more difficult to reach? As far as college students, I think it's even more important for, for them to have some sort of uh, be empowered to, to decide the questions that they're trying to learn. There's an amazing university called Quest University, and uh, they, they work on one subject for three and a half weeks, and they have four-hour classes every day and delve into profoundly deep questions uh, and just focus on that one thing. Um, and I think that's a really neat approach. I see, uh, I, I don't know if that answered the question, but I hope it helped. Kelly, uh, you can take over the mic now if you like. Um, David, I'm just wondering if you encounter parents who question inquiry as a methodology um, and request more traditional methods or um, like the lecture uh, test output um, over inquiry and how you respond to that. Uh, well, so far with our school, we've been pretty lucky, but we're, we're, we're a high school, uh, but we're a school of choice that just got started last year. And what that means is that we don't have a catchment that um, students come from. They actually have to choose to come to our school. And so we're, we're a bit lucky that anyone intending to come to the Inquiry Hub is kind of sold on the idea of inquiry to begin with. Uh, with respect to uh, lectures and tests, I think that um, I think that there are places still to uh, provide opportunities for for students to um, learn something where it takes a bit of work and repetition. I'm a math I'm a math teacher, or I have been a math teacher, uh, and you know I taught grade eight, and it was extremely frustrating. Uh, eight, grade eight and nine, but extremely frustrating when students would come up at that level and not have their times tables memorized. Um, and so, you know, there are times when you want students to work through, and, and you don't have to necessarily drill and kill. And there are amazing websites now where students can, at a very young age, you know, help catch butterflies while they do the multiplication tables. And, um, and so there's lots of opportunities for us to do things in different ways. Um, but I think that for me, when I'm, when I'm talking to parents about why this is of value, I ask them what they value for their, for their child. Do they want a child where, uh, you know, they're very good at following instructions and following along with the status quo and perhaps, you know, being laid off with several hundred people who are laid off um, when their jobs become redundant? Or do they want people who can think on their feet 
are challenged and actually can solve problems without someone else sort of holding their hand. And so to me, it's, it's about asking the, the parent what they really want. And uh, it's not about putting down the idea of lectures and tests so much as it is saying, is that really all that you want um, students to be good at? How is that? Am I missing I another question? I thought it was a good answer, personally. Yeah, thanks. We are, too, I, I too run an inquiry-based um, school that is choice. Um, we run into parents who choose it uh, and then, um, you know, in talking to others in the community or, you know, then they get questioned, well, what about when your child has yeah. to take tests to go into college, well, you know, how, how will that go? And I don't think that they're no. necessarily strong enough in inquiry um, themselves and in, in understanding how to be an inquirer that they can really answer and that's when kind of panic sets in and then they um, kind of second guess what's happening with their own child. Yeah. We, we, have, we have online courses that students do to cover the content um, and, you know, there are some more traditional tests that are taken as part of covering that content in, in our program. Uh, we have students who are soaring and we have some students that are struggling and trying to figure things out and going at your own pace and not having a teacher actually assist and help you along that process can be challenging. And I think it's important to say that I, I don't know that our school is for everyone. Uh, I think high schools, you know, big, large high schools serve purposes for different people and, you know, they they provide opportunities for um, students who really like to have a schedule and a set and it actually helps them learn to have a pattern. That um, it helps because it provides amazing elective opportunities that, you know, we, we let students choose their topics and uh, for, for different courses, but at the same time, you know, we don't have the full facilities that a, a large high school does. Um, and there's there just support structures that are available in, in a bigger school as well. So I'm not trying to knock one and say one's better than the other, but I think that every high school and every school for that matter has the potential to embed uh, more inquiry-based uh, kind of learning as part of what they do. And as we do that, I think less and less questions will come up about the value of it when we see that students are doing things that really matter. You know, I love the Chris Lehman's example of his students who actually designed um, a, a, a biodiesel engine um, for third world countries and then, you know, made it uh, free and open source for, for anybody to be able to use. I mean, those are students who are leaving their high school with, uh, you know, a life altering experience. And I believe, and this is, this is something that I think will help with parents, I believe that, you know, uh, I, I didn't share it with you, but if you went to uh, my students that did the inquiry garden, um, I'll go to the page now, the, the link that I provided here is actually to their blog that they started last year. And they haven't got it going again this year, but they will. And I think that when they, you know, add aquaponics and, and uh, hydroponics and the curriculum that they're designing for um, the, the younger grades to, to come and do gardening with them, when they start adding that to their blog, what they're doing is they're creating a phenomenal portfolio piece that I think speaks volumes over somebody who can sit and memorize a whole bunch of things and get an A on a test, um, you know, maybe get a higher percentage than them in math. Um, but I think that universities are really going to start paying attention to that portfolio piece and going, these people, these kids are already doing things that matter in the world and are trying to make a difference. And they understand how to be self-starters and how to learn. And they're not going to be a student who um, gets bogged down and drops out of, of high school because they don't know how to cope with real life outside of, you know, going home and studying for six hours each night. So I think that we're headed in the right direction and that we will still hit frustrations. Uh, and people trying to say, you know, well, it worked for me, or my my student isn't getting enough of 
this kind of learning, whatever that may be, uh, rote or whatever. So uh, I think we're just, we're going to have those battles, but but what we need to do is we need to build rigor into our inquiry and make sure that students are truly learning about learning and not just asking a question and then just trying to answer it without any depth or quality to what they're doing. And I don't think we have it perfect yet. We're working on it, uh, and it's just a fun process that the students are engaged in as well.